from Providence College, Ed Cooley. This guy, this guy is so popular that during dinner, while you were eating, they have renamed this place Hotel Cooley. <laughs> guy's huge. Where's the check? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're a basketball junkie, and who in this room is not, when you hear the coach's roll call from Providence College, it is like a who's who. Joe Mullaney, Rick Barnes, Rick Patino, uh, Dave Gabbett, Pete Gillen, Tim Welsh, and now Ed Cooley. This is one of the greatest college basketball programs, a small school, no football, and they have done it for years and years. And Coach, we offer our sincere congratulations once again. It was great to see you in New Orleans, but it's even better to have you in Atlanta tonight. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. How about his voice? So when you just started talking, I'm like, I love his voice. Can I borrow it, please? Absolutely. You are at my hotel. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. right. We all work now at so, Hotel Cool. I do want to borrow that. Isn't it his voice big time? Right. Hall of Fame voice right there. Thank you, sir. Let's talk about the good things of last year because it was really an incredible run to win 27 games, to win for PC the first time ever the regular season title in the Big East, to go to the Sweet 16. I mean... You got kids lining up at the dunk to get in hours before the game. This is what I would think every coach lives for, to have a season like that. The fact that I'm from the city of Providence and always wanted to play there, growing up just having a dream. I mean, one day I wanted to play there. And I remember Rick Pitino being the coach there. and uh, I remember Coach Gavitt. The fact that you can see what is now called Amica Mutual Pavilion, it's going to be hard for me to continue to say that because dunk was so synonymous with basketball. Y'all got to feel my skin real quick because like for me to do that from where I'm from, I am so grateful and so appreciative of the opportunity just to coach, let alone coach at home. And when you have an opportunity to do that, there comes with pressure, but pressure is a privilege. It's incredible, man. Like I'm sitting in there, I'm looking around and every seat is sold. When we took the job, there were 21 season ticket holders. Now there's 11,500. Do y'all feel me on that? You know, serious. It's, I'm going to keep dreaming. I'm dreaming sitting here right now. I have my beautiful wife here. Oh, hold on. Table eight. Hold on. Oh, uh, you too. Two forks. See, we follow instructions. Two forks. Two forks. I think there's another fork in here, table eight. Table eight. Two forks. But it's just an incredible, I have an opportunity to see Coach, you know, one of my mentors in here, to be sitting in here with you, Coach Kremens, seeing you, like, these are my childhood, like, icons with Coach Thompson, right, Nolan Richardson, George Raveling. Like, those were my inspirations because there wasn't many black coaches that we could grow up and aspire to be. And I hope that I can be a pioneer for some of the other young minority coaches coming up that just have a dream to be different, but in order to dream of being great. One day, I don't know how, but we're going to win a national championship at Providence College. You mentioned being from Providence. Tell our folks here a little bit about your backstory, how this all came to be. Well, if you start at the present, I'm married to the greatest person in the world, and that's Narice Cooley, who's here with me, you know, and, you know, and I, I mean that sincerely, and all of us have general managers, and she's my general manager, and uh, the salary cap's going up, though, baby, the salary cap's going up. Um, I'm one of nine children. I'm one of nine children. Um, I'm the only one that went to college. I met my dad when I was 12 years old at a bar and the song Planet Rock was playing. And when I met him, I walk in there and I see this guy, I'm like, I look just like this dude. <laughs> big ass nose, right? Uh, big belly. And I went over and I just said, thank you. You know, I just said thank you to him. Like, and we became really good friends. 
I went to high school in Providence. We won a couple of championships there on the Civic Center floor that now I coach on. Um, I went to a college where I was one of two black kids there and I was afraid, I was different. And it's okay to be different, that's what it, I'm telling you, when I was in college, I walked into the blizzard of seven, it was, it was like a blizzard. Everybody was white. <laughs> I'm like, damn, you know, they weren't listening to LL Cool J, they weren't listening to Run DMC, but I did learn a lot about Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I learned Brown Eyed Girl. I went to concerts of U2 and Pearl Jam and Jimmy Buffett, I mean, you know, Think about that, I'm from like the hood hood, like Jimmy Buffett, like living on sponge cake. Like I was going in the street singing that, everybody's looking at me like, what's wrong with this brother right here now? <laughs> Best thing that ever happened to me was it taught me how to be different and it's okay to be different. And when you are different, you're special. And I remember being in that first college party, we all think we're that dude, right? I'm a division two guy, I think I'm going to play for the Celtics, get out the way. And a kid comes over and touches my hand. Then he touches my hair. And I'm like, yo, bro, I'm from the hood. Don't, don't you dare touch me. He says, I never saw a black man in my life in person. I'm like, where the hell this dude from? I'm not gonna tell you where he's from. But I was the best man at his wedding. And it goes to tell you, if you have open, honest discussions, it comes, it's real. It's real when you can share your differences. And that's what I learned. I, that's what I learned about this. Being from Providence, no matter what job opportunities come out there, it's about fit. It's about where you belong to inspire other people, to give them hope, to give them something to look forward to that's right from their community. And I'm blessed to work for an incredible AD, an incredible president. It's turned over. But both the people that are now in charge were there from the beginning with me. And None of us have anything to complain. And when I think about what this game has done for just about everyone in here, think about, I've traveled around the world, winning gold medals, being paid, allowed me to pay for my children to go to school, allowed me to help my family from this little basketball, this ball that just bounces and continues to give back to us. It just keeps giving and giving and giving. So we gotta do a good job of giving back. We gotta make sure our game grows. We gotta keep the integrity high. Everybody's complaining about the portal and NIL. We just gotta to adjust to it. We'll be fine. There's a lot of differences in it, but we'll be okay at the end of the day. Let's continue to give back to this game that has made many of us in this room special. It's given us an identity and it's put a lot of money in our pockets, right? And we're gonna give that back for sure. Amen. Great perspective. So Ed, why coaching? Why did you decide to go down that career path. I was a high school teacher for two years, and I like teaching, but I love coaching. I feel I was born a leader. I think I was a leader when I was two days old. I just believe in not being afraid to fail and going out and trying and asking for help, you know? Um, coaching brings joy. Uh, it's a lot of losses, and I don't think you dwell on the wins, but you get better because of the way you lose and how you lose. Um, you're gonna lose some games, it's part of life, you're gonna lose in life. I just think coaching is like incredible. The fact that they pay us to coach, call timeouts and get yelled at, well who you're recruiting, blah, 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 blah. You always get what you need, not everything you want. I'm a big believer in that. And the fact that I'm sitting here is telling me I lost a lot of recruits, I lost a lot of games, but I'm still getting exactly what I need to be the best that I can be. Every coach has a mentor, somebody that you know, was hands-on. You know, you mentioned earlier some of the coaching mentors, but who was it that sometimes it's a high school coach, sometimes it's a college coach, sometimes it's AAU, it could be anybody, but who was it for Ed Cooley that got you on this path? Who I get a little shooken up when, I, when, and when I'm asked that. It's, uh, it's a woman who took me off the streets. I was somewhat homeless growing up. And when I left a home that the lights didn't come on, there was no food, um, she died uh, August of 2010. And it's the first time I ever heard somebody say, I love you. And her name is Gloria Seawright. Her husband is Ed Seawright, who, is, who was a janitor, and he worked two full-time jobs. And they bought me in, and I never left their home when I was nine years old, and I never left. Of which, in that home, 11 college degrees came out of that home two of which came from Providence College. 
to have a mentor, to have a hero, to have somebody who just believed in you and saw something special in you, not taken away from my biological parents at all because I'm grateful that they met and had me. But I could not be here today if I did not see dad come home and hand mom the check on Fridays. And dad would come out and have a couple of, uh, was it seven and sevens I think they were called? <laughs> but never missed a game, held us accountable. If we didn't go to class, if we had bad grades, we couldn't play. And I think that's transformed my thought. I haven't seen a check in 28 years since I met my wife. That's the, <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. Now, because you got direct deposit and all this Venmo shit and everything that's happening now, right? I mean, I don't, I coach cash app, Venmo, pay, ah, I, I just keep a knot, right? It's, um, I well up when I think of her. Dad is going to be 85 years old on October 21st. He has not missed a home game since I've been the head coach at Providence. He's the first one in the building. He comes to practice. And when I see him, I become like this kid again. Like he's, he's Eddie. His son is Eddie. I'm Eddie. My dad's name is Eddie. My sister's dad's name is Eddie. There's no way in the hell I was naming my son Eddie. <laughs> So that's, um, I miss her, and she's in the room with us right now. Wow. We feel her presence. Thank you so much. So how does that affect you now as the head coach with your coaching and recruiting, what you went through? I always want the, you know, right now I'm currently waiting for two kids to commit to us as I'm sitting here. If this phone rings, I love y'all, but I need some dues, right? <laughs> um, I am incredibly vulnerable and transparent with our prospects. I need them to know who I am as a man, not as a coach. And I think when you let people into your soul and you let them know who you are as a person, it's easy to recruit as a coach because they see you. And I learned that from Narice. Narice always tells me, you have to see people. And I've learned from that because I'm very rare in my present. All of us are always on our phones, we're distracted in many ways. So I had to learn to be where my feet are and stay present and listen and hear at the same time. And that's what I tell the recruits. You know, you're gonna win some, you're gonna lose some. But last time I checked, I was the Naismith College Coach of the Year. <laughs> right One of the hallmarks of your PC team last year was the ability to win close games. It was almost a magic carpet ride when it comes to some of those endings. Uh, all coaches know there are, you know, leprechauns and the basketball gods, and why did that shot go in and that one not? But there is something to the confidence that a team builds with their ability to, to pull it out. You never think you're out of it. Is that sort of the feeling you got from those guys last year? Well, I was, I was mentored by Coach Skinner. I worked for him for 10 years. Al Skinner, great coach, you know, came, was here at Kennesaw for a while. But we would always practice last four minutes of the game. And to this day, I still do that. We start practice with the end of the game. You know, it's four minutes left in the game, up two, down two, nut, up nine, down nine. Practice what you want to become and get them, tell them, hey, we're going to play in a lot of close games. We're going to win a lot of road games. Speak them into existence so when it's happening, it's easy or not easy, nothing's easy. I'm saying at least we've been there. So I think you got to practice it. A little luck comes into play. Talent goes a long way, right? Talent goes a hell of a long way. Um, you know, and you have to make sure you're pushing the right buttons at the right time. And if you have a great staff, scouting comes into play listening as the head coach. Sometimes head coach are not vulnerable enough to let the people that they hire help them, right? We don't have all the answers. We're not Naismith, right? We don't have all the answers. You have to listen when you lead. If you listen, you become that much greater. Let the record show the Providence College Friars were 11 and two last year in games decided by five points or fewer. Pretty impressive. There's this day and age of college basketball, so much change. Sure. Um, you mentioned NIL. You mentioned the transfer portal, uh, conference affiliations. From the Providence perspective, what does it look like up there in Rhode Island when you see the changes that are going on in the sport that you love so dearly? Whew. Um, first of all, the site from Providence, Rhode Island is beautiful. <laughs> the food is good. The people can't drive. You don't know what the hell we're saying. It's... <laughs> Right, it's parking, it's cars, right? 
right? Babel's in here. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. It is, um, it's a little scary, yet when you don't have football and you're a basketball-centric conference, you don't have to worry about some of the other stuff, right? Um, I think you have to continue to stay aligned with some of the football conferences so that you're in the room when conversations are being had on change. And we're, we're aligned well. Val Ackerman, who I believe is one of the smartest business basketball minds in the country, we have a great leader. So we really lean on her and the presidents. The fact that we're just basketball centric make us special, make us really special. I think the coaching that's in our league is really special. Every conference comes after our coaches every single year. And, you know, we've been lucky enough to keep our, our coaches. You know, we lost a couple of good ones last year. Obviously, Jay retired, who really was the, you know, the leader of the league, winning a couple of national championships and just being Jay. My wife thinks Jay is really handsome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I told Jay, go to hell. That's what I tell you know. <laughs> he come walking up in his nice dapper suits. Hey, Maurice, how you doing? Get your ass out of here. Right. 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 So it is, it's challenging because we are 4,200 students, right? And what I, what I respect about Providence College is they give us every resource to be successful. The word no doesn't exist. The word is how can we help? And that's why it's a special match for me. You know, there's two realities, as you know. Uh, there's the media that gets plastered everywhere that we see. And then there's what's really going on uh, behind the scenes and with your team and your administration and your conference. But I think fans want to know, like from a coaching perspective, how do you navigate NIL in its so new, so fresh, there don't seem like there's guardrails in place, uh, and particularly at a school like Providence, mm -hmm. And then how do you handle the transfer portal where you can kind of come and go as you please these days? I've been thinking about that question on the plane coming here because it's, first of all, don't complain about it. I think the NCAA for a period of time had a monopoly on what I would say rights, more or less, and never changed with the landscape of college athletics. It was moving like a hurricane and we were staying still. I think in order for us to be better, we have to continue to change, mold, adjust. This NIL thing for Providence, I'm speaking for Providence College, it's like right now we're talking to kids and if the first question is about what kind of deal do I have, my question is, well, how good are you? That's the God's honest truth. If I got Shaq in front of me, I, I think I got a great deal for you. But I think you, it is so difficult, yet you have to explain it. You have Alston money that goes to the children now. You have cost of attendance. You have an education. You have wellness. You have an MRI. If some of us get hurt, and many of us in here are very fortunate, an MRI is what, a month out, two months out, right? See a doctor here, odds is two, two hours. And I tell our parents that. So you gotta educate the parents on what's really important to you. I tell them if you chase purpose and you chase opportunity, you'll surpass any dollar you'll ever make. And I'm a true, true believer in that, for sure. Chase purpose, right? And if the number's too high, we ain't getting you anyway. You're just wasting my damn time. But if you wanna be coached, you wanna be loved, you wanna be educated, and you want an opportunity to be you, all right? There'll be a certain number, I don't know what Providence College is yet, with this collective that a third party, which I'm struggling with, because the third party tells you basically what you can do. I have one general manager, that chick right over there. <laughs> like, you're not buying my groceries and I gotta cook it, hell no. We're gonna have a God's honest conversation and you're gonna do what I tell you to do. And I'm not asking, this is not a democracy, right? Thank you for doing what you do, but this is my job. You just happen to run this collective that you think you know. You may know how to sell basketballs or shoes or, insurance, but you don't know what I know. And I think that is a big, big deal with the NIL. With this portal at Providence, we've always taken transfers. This is something that when you're at a small school like that, you're not going to go out recruit a brand, right? You're not. You're just not. Unless, you know, you gave birth to that person and then maybe they don't want to play for you. So 
Be real with who you are, and that's what makes you special. I always tell our staff, don't go recruit somebody that can play at Providence. Recruit somebody that can play for me. And I think that's the separator because not everybody can play for each coach. I want somebody who's tough, somebody who has incredible gratitude and appreciation, somebody who opens doors, somebody who smiles, somebody who gives. If you have that as a foundation, something good's going to come out of that. You're not going to win every game, but you're going to win enough to keep your job. You're going to win enough to go on vacation. You're going to win enough to be special. Yeah, so well said. Have you noticed a, a change in the conversations when you talk to kids and their parents oh, these yeah. days? Yeah. So what's it like? What's your NIL deal? <laughs> I, I don't know. How good are you? Um, they're uncomfortable because it's something that I don't believe in, but I understand. Right? I, I, don't, I don't believe in it, yet I get it, and we have to adjust to it. I think what we do, what we do as coaches and what we do as leaders, we do a lot for our young men and women. We do a ton for them, and I don't think people see that. They just see what the coach is making, what the school is making, what the city is making. And I get that because in the past, we couldn't buy a kid a meal. We couldn't pay for a haircut. We couldn't get them soap, toothpaste, lotion, like basic needs that the NCAA held us up on. So I understand that. But to go from zero to a million, we got to do something to help our game restructure this NIL situation. And it's going to take some time to get there. But if we all complain about it, nothing's getting done. Let's get in the room. Let's continue to talk. Let's continue to adjust. Let's continue to make change that makes this sport great once again. And it's still great. It's got some issues, but hell, we're here. Who was your favorite player growing up? Come on, Dr. J. <laughs> Dr. J. Magic, Michael. Those would be Artis Gilmore. I loved Artis Gilmore. Big dude. I always thought I was going to be. Artis Gilmore looks like my dad. That's why I say that, you know. But my dad wasn't 7'2 or whatever and left-handed and blocking shots and in the Hall of Fame, right? Dad sold me out. <laughs> uh, is your favorite player now Jared Bynum? My favorite player right now? <laughs> I don't have one. My team's terrible right now. I, I don't. Um, Jared has uh, really come along. He's come, He's a, come long a long way. way. Come he a had a great way. year last year. Yeah. Really good. And he, you talk about sacrifice to be good. I asked him to, be, to come off the bench because everybody thinks starting is a big deal. You know, from Maryland and 6'2 and 190 pounds, wearing number three. Nobody cares. <laughs> we care about winning. And he sacrificed for the team. And I, this is how we got him. I said, Jared. You're going to play against a starter who's tired, and then you're going to play against a backup that you're way better than. Who, does, who doesn't want to sign up for that? He goes, oh, coach. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> so he really bought into um, coming off the bench, and it, it really is what made that team so special. You got to retool, you know, for the new season. How's it going so far? With this new transfer situation, we have eight new players. Eight. We have two players that played significant minutes last year. We have somebody who would be red-shirted and somebody who didn't even get a cup of coffee. He got a sip, right? I think we have tournament talent. We're far from a tournament team right now because we don't have an it factor yet. You know, we're trying to learn and grow and develop that. But I think we'll get there. You know, we'll probably have some losses people will be upset at, but it's okay. Everybody has a right to be mad. I'm going to still cash my check, though, Coach. I'll tell you that. Be mad all you want, baby. First of the month comes, babe, where we going? Capitol Grill. They'd be mad all they want. I'm going to get my state. We'll win the next one. I guess. It's, it's hard. It's hard when, when you're trying to develop eight new players, of which. Six will probably have to play, right? Six will have to play. So we'll figure it out. When you look back, what was the best part of last year? The singing in the locker room, the camaraderie. In the when they knew we didn't go into one game last year where we didn't think we could win, not one. We never lost back-to-back -back games last year. They gave me energy. They would come into the, the coaches' meetings, and I'd say, Coach, we got practice today. This is what we want to do. Now, you have to really trust your players and check your ego at the door as the leader. 
and not many of us want to do that. So I looked at it, and they were most of the time spot and make a couple of adjustments. But if they have blood in it and they have flesh in it, do what they want to do. You never know where it'll take you. They'll make adjustments in the game. Coach, flip our defense this way or flip the ball screen coverage this way. I'll always come to the huddle and say, hey, how are they guarding you? What do you want to do? What, what, what's, what's our deal? But we practice that, and that's the God's honest truth. you got to be a listener and leave your ego at the door as a listener. Ed Cooley, this thing right here is for you for all time. Your name will always be on it. You'll That's always be a part of our family. That's unbelievable. <laughs> but I tell you, the best part about this for us and for college basketball is that you're still in the game. Yes. You're coaching, you're mentoring young men and families, and this game is better because of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ed Cooley, ladies Thank and gentlemen. You.